I think it's time for a special segment we call Down the Rabbit Hole. And Down the Rabbit Hole is where I answer a question that you didn't ask, or maybe you did ask, but not during this Q&A session, um, that I want to ask myself. So, um, and then I answer it. So I ask it and then I answer it. It's basically cheating. Uh, really, it is. It's, it's my opportunity to do whatever the hell I want um, and ignore the questions that are on the board. Um, now, if you have a, a problem or a complaint about this, um, we have embedded a special complaint mechanism right into your browser. Um, if you move your mouse um, to the top right of your browser, there's a little X symbol. And if you click on that, you will be able to register your complaint about this live stream. Um, by closing your browser. Um, for those of you who are still here, we're now going to do down the rabbit hole. And in this down the rabbit hole, I want to talk about three topics that I absolutely love and smoosh them all together. Cryptocurrency or cryptography, physics, and astronomy. Let's go. All right, in this down the rabbit hole, I want to answer a question that I have heard a few times in various variations, um, but not today. And I want to answer it um, for you today in a new way. And this question um, that happens in a variety of ways is like the following. Why is it that two people can't generate the same private key? Or um, how can a wallet generate a private key offline simply by picking a random number and be sure that nobody else has picked that private key before? Or how do I know that nobody else is using the same seed as me? Or how do I know that nobody else can figure out or guess which private keys I'm using? Since there may be millions of users generating millions of private keys out there. And this is a, a really common question, and it has to do with the sheer magnitude of the numbers we're talking about, and it's um, a topic that is often misunderstood. So let's put it into perspective. First of all, let's understand that a private key is a number. That's all it is. It's a PIN number, if you like, and it's a, a number that allows you to um, identify yourself as the owner, um, and sign for uh, an amount that is stored on the blockchain. And signing is another mathematical or arithmetic manipulation you do uh, based on your private key, this very long number. Now, you'll often hear me say that a private key is just a very long number, but how long is it exactly? A private key on the elliptic curve used in Bitcoin is a 256-bit number. That means it is 256 binary digits. So in math, we would uh, estimate that number, we would calculate that number rather, not estimate, um, as two to the power 256. Now, uh, most people have problems with exponents. And to demonstrate how most people have problems with exponents, I'm going to purposely make several errors in this rabbit hole where I will mix up what I'm saying about exponents. But I'm, I'm doing this entirely deliberately just so that you can feel more comfortable um, about the fact that all of us make mistakes. No, I'm not. All right, um, so two to the 256. Okay, what is that number? That's two multiplied by two, multiplied by two, multiplied by two, by two, by two, by two, by two. And if you line up the number two, 256 times, multiplying it by itself, you get two to the 256. All right, so now let's talk about why exponents are so weird. Um, what is half of two to the 256? Well, half of two to the 256 is two to the 255. Now, you may have thought that half of two to the 256 is two to the 128. That's a normal thing, but then you're confusing the exponent with the number itself. The exponent tells you how many times you multiply by two. So two to the 255 times two is 255 twos in a row and one more. So it's 256 twos in a row. So two to the 256 is double what two to the 255 is. 
And this consecutive doubling creates an unfathomably large number. Now we say unfathomably, but what exactly does that mean? Well, first of all, let's make things easier and turn it into decimal. So if you take 2 to the 256 and you express it in terms of a decimal number, it becomes a number that is 10 to the 77. That means you could write 1 and add 77 zeros after it and you would have this number. 77 zeros. It's 10 times 10 times 10, 77 times. How big is that? Well, often people try to use physical analogies. Um, so, you know, what do we use for expressions of things that are very big? A drop in the ocean? Um, not good enough, because there are more than 10, there are far, far more numbers in 10 to the 77 than there are drops in all of the oceans. So let's try something else. How about a grain of sand? Um, a grain of sand out of all of the grains of sand, all of the grains of sand in all of the beaches, in all of the ocean floor, in all of the deserts on the entire planet Earth. How many grains of sand are there? Well, people have done a variety of calculations and the numbers they come up with are really speculative. But many people would agree on a number around 10 to the 20. So that's 10 with 20 zeros, 10 to the 20 grains of sand. Um, there are 10 to the 20 grains of sand on planet Earth. Let's assume that's true. The thing with exponents is how off do you have to be? It's somewhere between 10 to the 16 and 10 to the 20. But 10 to the 20 is 10,000 times more than 10 to the 16. So, you know, one or two numbers in the exponent aren't going to make a big difference in your calculation. Um, it's a huge difference in the number. So if, I'm, if, if it's not 10 to the 20, but it's 10 to the 19, that's 10 times less sand, but it doesn't really change my comparison to a number as big as 10 to the 77. All right, let's keep going. So one out of 10 to the 20 grains of sand isn't enough to explain the sheer number of private keys. If I put this into your mind and I said, go out there on the beach and pick one grain of sand. Now, what is the chance that somebody else who walked out onto that specific beach could pick that specific grain of sand? Hell, even if I told you pick one grain of sand out of a bucket, what are the chances that somebody else could pick that grain of sand out of that bucket? Now take it to the beach, now take it to the entire ocean floor, now take it to every beach on the planet and all of the deserts that are tens of feet deep with sand. And now you're beginning, no, you're not. You're not beginning anything. We're still at 10 to the 20 and we don't even realize how bad that is, how badly it represents the number 10 to the 77. So let's take it one step further. Let's take one grain of sand and think about what it's made of. And it's made of, well, it's made of molecules, really. Um, molecules of a substance that is primarily silica, the most common substance on this planet. So molecules of silica. Well, how many molecules of silica in a single grain of sand? A, a, a speck that is about a millimeter cubed. Um, how many grains? Uh, how many molecules in that grain? Well, we can do a calculation based on uh, a number uh, called the Avogadro number that calculates the amount of atoms in uh, one mole of a substance. And if you do the math, you're going to end up with a number that is surprisingly very similar to the number I mentioned before, 10 to the 20. So there is approximately 10 to the 20 molecules of silica in one grain of sand, more or less. All right, so we've got 10 to the 20. So if I look at a single grain of sand and I looked at it under an electron microscope and I could see down to the single molecule of silica and I said, pick one of those. Now, what if we multiply these two numbers together? What if we said, pick a molecule of silica from any grain of sand anywhere on the planet? Does that give us a bigger number? Oh boy, I mean, that's 10 to the 20 times 10 to the 20. And, and that's what? 10 to the 40. 
So this is how exponents work. If you multiply two numbers together, it's the same as adding up their exponents. So 10 to the 20, so 20 tens in a row, multiplied by another 20 tens in a row give you 40 tens in a row. It's fairly simple once you think of it as simply a series of multiplications. So 10 to the 40 molecules of silica on this planet. How far are we from 10 to the 77? Whew, still a ways to go. All right, but what, what if we took all of the planets? The solar system has how many? Well, Pluto is or isn't a planet. Are we counting the sun? Do gas giants have sand? Let, let's just assume there's 10. We're rounding. There's 10 planets. Why am I doing that? Because we're counting in base 10. So let's take all of the planets in the entire solar system. Whew. Um, all of the planets in the entire solar system, let's say it's 10, we're rounding. And they're all made of sand. They're made basically sand and times 10 planets. Um, so did we put a dent? We had 10 to the 40 molecules of silica on this planet. Uh, what happens when you multiply that number by 10? All right, 10 to the 41. Shit, we're really not making any progress here. Um, okay, let's, let's go bigger, let's go bigger. The Milky Way, um, 100 billion stars. That should do it, right? 100 billion stars. What's 100 billion? So a billion is, is nine zeros, and 100 billion is 10, 11 zeros. So um, all of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy, uh, assuming each one is a solar system like Earth and has 10 sandy planets, it's completely exaggerating. Uh, we don't know that, um, but let's take all of that. So we just added 11 10 to the 11, and we multiplied that by 10 to the 41, and now we're at 10 to the 52. Shit, we're still not anywhere near 10 to the 77. We've just done all of the molecules of silica in all of the sand, in all of the sandy planets in the solar system and across the entire Milky Way of 100 billion stars, and we're still at 10 to the 52? What do I have to do with you people? All right, let, let's take all of the galaxies. Fuck it, all of them. How many are there? We don't know, 100 billion galaxies, possibly? 100 billion galaxies, that's just 11. That's just 10 to the 11. We multiply all of the galaxies that we know of times all of the molecules of silica and all of the beaches and oceans and all of the planets across the entire solar system and all of the stars and all of the galaxies in all of the galaxies. And we're at 10 to the 63 and we're still nowhere near 10 to the 77. And I could keep going, but somebody's already done that. And the person who did this is a person called Eddington. And Eddington tried to come up with an estimate of how many atoms of everything there are in the entire visible, observable universe. That means if you take the observable universe, which is the part of the universe that has light that will ever reach us, the matter that is all within the observation cone of space-time that we occupy as humans, 13.8 billion light years across in space-time, and you take that, uh, and you take all matter, every, every atom of hydrogen in that entire observable universe, and you count all of these atoms, 10 to the 77 is the number you come up with. The Eddington number happens to be, the center of the range of estimates for the Eddington number happens to be the same as the maximum number of keys in Bitcoin, which means that every atom of matter in the entire observable universe of 100 billion galaxies and more, everything that is making up everything that we can observe in our space-time cone could have its own Bitcoin private key. So pick an atom, any atom, and see if somebody else picks the same one. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. That is from sand to atoms to the entire observable universe. Why can't someone else guess my private key? If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe, like, and share. All my work is shared for free, so if you want to support it, join me on Patreon.